Nino Brown, CFB Prime. Colorado throwing up the deuces to the Pac-12. P.J. Fleck, too tough. Nebraska tight end coach Bob Wagner resigns very quickly on this episode. Shh, blow the damn whistle. Some of you in the room right now, you are where you are. You're giving 60% when you have 120 in you. Why? Because you never made a decision. You already there. Your problem is this is stuff you don't want to give up the court. Listen to me. Power for power. Any agent in the room. Power for power. Motivational speaker. Power for power. Entrepreneur. Power for power. Athlete. Power for power. Weightlifter. Power for power. Whatever you do, I guarantee you, when you do it, nobody can do it like you do it. The problem is you don't hardly do it. Welcome back to CFP Prime. You know the deal. I'm your host, you know Brown. We're gonna be talking a couple topics going around in college football before you know college football actually gets. Going in a couple, you know, we're less, almost less, uh, less 25 days. Get a little bit of college football. So well, let's talk. Let's talk Colorado. That's the, the elephant in the room. They're chucking up the deuces. They're Pac-12. They're saying, yo, we're going back. Big 12. And then you got people just, you know, hating on Dion. Listen, I'm a Dion fan. Not necessarily I'm a Colorado fan. Um, but everybody who watches this show, watches CFB Nation, knows that. I'm an Oregon Ducks fan. So when my guy Dan Lanning reacts in a way or doesn't react in a way, then I got people around me saying, oh, I don't know what you're going to do. And he comes out and just says, I'm just trying to remember what they won to affect this conference because I don't remember. Dan, I, I'm with you. I don't remember either. Do you remember them winning anything? Because I don't remember them winning anything. And they haven't won anything. We're going five coaches since 2011, right? They've had one single win, winning season since 2011 when they came on. Like, what? Dion came in with the Louis luggage and said, this is not acceptable. You guys are out. So when the other coaches in the conference say something about it, we, we got to throw shade at them? I, 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 don't, I don't get it. But in the, in the respect of Colorado taking off and going to the Pac-12, you know, I, listen, this all falls on Big George, okay? Because you don't want to make a decision, okay? You say the longer you wait, the better your options are. And you think that the board of directors realizes that? Well, do you realize that it expires in 2024? Do you realize that you're in the possibility of losing three, pretty much four teams in the Pac-12 in one season? Like, do you, do you realize that? Is that a reality to you guys? That this Apple podcast streaming, whatever baloney that you're trying to sign with that media, just is probably for a third of the money that these guys are getting in the Big 12, and you can't save nobody? Do you realize that Paul Finnebaum, one of the biggest guys in college football, is calling the Pac-12 dead? They can no longer be a Power 5 conference where they're at with eight teams? Is that a reality yet, Big, Big George? Have you come to that reality yet? Please, we would like to know. The people that are in the Pac-12, they want to know. They want an answer. Because that's why Dion's out. This is why everybody's leaving. Because the media deal is garbage. Listen, Colorado has been good. They only made $94 million in revenue last year. They're going to get $31.7 million in TV revenue the minute they stop playing in the Big 12. A cha-ching. A thank you very much. Can I have another? Can you hate on it? But this isn't your 2011 Big 12. No. You're not going to be the big dog anymore. You're coming in the tail between your legs. You're probably coming in off a losing season to close out the Pac-12. So... Maybe Dion doesn't respond. And maybe, just maybe, Colorado just lets it simmer now because they've done what they needed to do. Yeah, they sold out the only spring game ever for them. Yes, they were the only spring game that was on ESPN. Yes, they sold out two games already this season. Full sold out. I haven't sold out a game in 10 years. Yes, this is the Dion effect. Okay, I get all that. All right? But what's the big effect that everybody else wants to see? It's dubs. bro, And we can't see that yet. So maybe... Maybe this is what was just the last of the stew. The ingredients are all in place, and he's good. Now we can just get to playing football. But Big 12 doesn't stop, right? Because now the rumor is possibly Arizona's coming over, right? It's just a done deal. But can UConn be the piece of the puzzle? 
Because it went from 14 to now with Arizona, Colorado, it would be 16. And UConn brings, you know, an added piece to it. It would make them 17. And from what I'm reading and researching, I hear that 20 is the possible ultimate goal for the Big 12. I think UConn holds that Willy Wonka golden ticket, though, right? Well, it, it would be 16 Willy Wonka golden tickets because that's 16 men's or women's college basketball titles that they'd be bringing to the Big 12 that they haven't seen in a very long time, if not ever. But they're also bringing college football program on the rise. You know, outside of the fact that they got a possible NFL draft pick in Jackson Mitchell at the linebacker position and an up-and-coming running back in Victor Rosa, Jim Moore Jr. took a team that was 1-11 and flipped them around a 6-7 and seven last year. And now they're kind of like a buzz that these conferences are looking at because they got the golden ticket behind them and they're a program, college football, that kind of created a little bit of buzz because they play that old style of football. But they also have possible, you know, dual threat QB lined up in the backfield to go. So it's possible that UConn could be waiting in the balance to see what happens, or UConn could be, you know, the next domino to fall. One thing's for sure, Colorado brought the Louis luggage, and Colorado's leaving with the Louis luggage full of Ben Franks. So that's enough about Colorado. Let's move on to another. Is it a soft subject, or is it too tough? Is, is, is P.J. Fleck too tough at Minnesota? Or is he just weird? Because everything I do when I look at this research, it just pops up. This is some weird, weird things. Like, yeah, I get you know, if you do better at practice and you do better on the field, you better grades and you do community service and you're, you know, a leader in the locker room, you might get a little bit of leeway when things go wrong or don't go wrong, right? I'm cool with that. I understand that. But to get a flex bank and have credits, a system that allows players to earn enough coins to get away with things like positive drug tests, and other team violations... See, now that seems weird. Like, call it whatever you want to call it, but a fleck bank? Like, you got to name it after yourself? Like, that's just odd. And, yes, that probably happens on all teams, but not all teams have four to six whistleblowers. You know what I mean? Like, this flex bank counts your community service. It counts, like, keeps tabs on your studying habits, things, how your classes are going. Like, y- you can lose credits you can gain credit it's just it's just a weird situation but some guys who had a lot of credit in the bank tested positive for things and used their coins to get off where they probably should have gotten in trouble and was hushed under the rug and then you got people saying that they were rushed back from injuries and the things the lingo that he says like they had to learn a whole lingo of you know out interisms and all these different things. He had all these weird setups that they, they had to learn and he had to re listen. A man had a simple instruction that he laid everything out for. You had to clap before he entered the locker room. And he would re enter locker rooms if the ovation wasn't to his liking. Man, that is just straight weird to me. Like he wanted it to be a family but it's a family of do what I tell you to do. It's just, yes, I understand, and, and, and I probably will get ripped for saying this word, there's a pussification of America where, you know, everybody gets trophy and, and everything else and participation. I'm not about that, and I'm sorry if I, I might ruffle some feathers, but that you got to learn how to lose to appreciate how to win. Now, you got to learn how to win to know how to win. Like, you, you, you can't. And then everybody wins. You can't just be out there in, in left field playing with the blades of grass between your feet and think that you're just as good as the kid that's throwing 10 Ks. No, it's not. You, you don't deserve the trophy for not putting in the work. So, yeah, you got to work hard. And those who work hard and do well, maybe they get a little bit of leeway. But I don't know what's going on with P.J. Fleck. I, it, I think he's more weird than he is too tough. I just, some people... Just ruffle the feathers of the wrong, wrong gentlemen, wrong young men, and then we go get whistles, and that's the end of it. Do I think he's too tough? No. Do I think he's too weird? You're damn straight. On another weird topic, 
maybe not weird, so a sour note. Nebraska's tight ends coach, uh, Bob Wagner, resigns last week. He was hired, you know, December 30th, 2022, to be the new tight ends coach. And the reason I bring it up is because we interviewed Ishmael Smith Flores, and he played a you know intricate part in bringing in Smith Flores to Nebraska as a tight end. Um, and Smith Flores is, is a great young gentleman who's got a bright young future in front of him. But Wagner uh, resigned after driving, and they tried to cover it up in the media. And I understand to save face with people. It was just a driving violation. Uh, it was a driving under the influence citation last week. It was at 1 a.m., right? He had blood alcohol content of 0.15. And maybe it was a little bit harsh um, to Wagner. But the problem is, it's just a few years ago, they dealt with a wide receivers coach by the name of Keith Williams who had to serve 30 days in jail for his third DUI while he was there. So, yeah, they got rid of that problem, and they don't want to bring that up. It's just too soon. You know, I understand it's six years, but it's just too soon. Now, Wagner's gone, and you might think, oh, well, you know, he had ties to a lot of recruits, but he, he's replaced by a young kid coming in, SMU tight ends coach, Josh Martin. Josh Martin's no chump. He's, he's done his thing. I mean, he, he groomed Kyle Granson, put him on the Blitnikoff watch list in 2020, right? He had 1,200 yards, 14 touchdowns in two seasons, 78 receptions, got drafted in the fourth round to the Indianapolis Colts, still in the NFL. So he knows what he's doing. So the tight end room is still in good hands. This your past history, and now you're underneath a new regime with Matt Rule. We can't, the, the Nebraska can't afford. And that's what they think. We can't afford any of this. I'm sorry, sir. You might have just been a mistake, but we got to let you go. They let him save base and, and resign on his own. You know, you can't have the negativity when you're trying to grow positivity, especially when you're turning the program around with all that bad frost from before. Soon. Very soon. We'll be talking more about on-field product instead of off-field issues. I'm Nino Brown. This is CFB Prime. I love each and every one of you guys. Let's blow the damn whistle. Shh.